Hi everyone, my name is Petr Velichkovic and I'm a senior research scientist at DeepMind and it is my great pleasure to be coming back to the DLG workshop at KDD once again this year. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, for this year's iteration as well. It's a great pleasure. I'll be talking to you about the follow-up work that uh, was initially kick-started uh, through the works that I described in my last year's DLG presentation and has now really taken a life of its own. We will be talking about neural algorithmic reasoning, the art of building uh, neural networks that have algorithmic properties baked inside them. And what this means is that in this talk, we will really be studying these classical algorithms, the kinds of algorithms you might find in a computer science textbook, such as sorting, searching, pathfinding, data structures, and so on. But obviously, because we're talking about them in a deep learning workshop context, we will be seeing how we can take classical algorithms and inject just a little bit of neural spice in them to make them more broadly applicable. So what I would like to do today is address three key questions. First, why should you as a deep learning practitioner be mindful of algorithms and study them? And specifically, why might it be a good idea to make neural networks that have more algorithmic properties? And once I hopefully convince you on why this is a good idea, we will talk a little bit more about how we can build neural networks that behave like an algorithm. And well, I'll also justify why am I telling you all of this in a workshop that is on graph machine learning. Uh, further, once we've given some ideas on how to build such models, we should also address the question of does this proposed approach actually work when deployed? And what are some domains where you might uh, think about applying them? Okay, so uh, assuming we're all clear on the agenda, let's start with uh, the first item. Let's motivate why it's a good idea to study classical algorithms. And the reason why I like to uh, motivate algorithms and study them is because I see them as an essential pure form of combinatorial reasoning. In a way, algorithms uh, correspond to timeless principles that will be relevant regardless of what the model of computation ends up being like. Nowadays, CPUs or GPUs, TPUs, in the future, if quantum computing becomes prevalent, you will still very likely be describing the computations on such a system through the lens of algorithms. And their abstractions allow us to really think about them in a way that's decoupled from any form of perception. And algorithms also come with many super favorable properties, such as they trivially strongly generalize to inputs that are much bigger than the ones you originally looked at when you designed the algorithm. They're usually expressed in the language of subroutines, which makes them compositional. Uh, we can very often prove that they're correct and that they will terminate in a certain amount of time or using a certain amount of space. And finally, because they're given often in a sort of pseudocode form, the operations of them are really interpretable. And I hope that you can see that all these things that are super favorable about algorithms tend to be things that are uh, the pain points when applying deep neural networks, especially industrially. And just generally for me personally, this approach hits very close to home because uh, algorithms, theoretical computer science, and competitive programming are what brought me into computer science in the first place. Um, okay, so now we will be moving on to a particular example of an algorithm, just so we can motivate um, uh, why all of these concepts hold and just to present the problem that I personally find very cool as a, as a motivating first step. And that is the maximum flow problem. So typically we'll be assuming in this case that our input is given in an abstractified form of a graph that, has, that represents a flow network, which means that uh, your graph doesn't just have nodes and edges, but is also augmented with this capacity function that tells you what's the maximum amount of flow that you can unleash on a particular edge. And two nodes are special, the source and the sink. The source is able to unleash infinite flow and the sink is able to receive infinite flow. And a valid flow in such a flow network is any mapping that assigns flow values to edges, this F, such that for no edge you're exceeding the capacity of that particular edge. And also, with the exception of the source and the sink, for every other node in the network, all the flow that comes in is equal to all the flow that comes out. So the total flow in the network is conserved from the source to the sink. And then you can compute the value of a particular flow as the total flow that emanates from the source vertex. 
And in the maximum flow problem, we are interested in maximizing the total flow in the network. So to kind of make things really concrete, I've given one simple example of a flow network where uh, we actually can compute a flow of uh, quantity 17. So you can see there's in total 17 units of flow being emanated from the source and 17 units floating into the sink and all the other nodes have flow preservation and no capacities are exceeded. And it can be shown that indeed there are no more units of flow that can be unleashed in this particular example. Now, when you define a problem in such a rigorous abstract way, it often makes it really easy to abstract away the complexity of the real world and just have a super elegant and provably correct solution for it. And in the case of max flow problems, one such blueprint is the Ford Fulkerson method, which is so elegant that you can represent it in just four lines of abstract pseudocode. As long as there's a path where you can unleash extra flow, do that. And the specific way in which you find for this path, uh, such as uh, breadth first search, depth first search, and so on, yields different instantiations of the Ford Fulkerson method with different uh, complexity and termination guarantees. But in either case, you can verify that a very abstractified method like this one can be proven to terminate with the correct solution, which is quite amazing. And I'm going to dive right into the original paper that uh, uh, proposed uh, the max flow problem in the context of evaluating real net capacities, partly to show how these connections naturally arise when you look at problems abstractly, but partly also to show a fundamental flaw in, uh, in setups like this. So the core problem that we're going to be dealing with here is that these classical algorithms, while being nice and abstract, and enforcing their inputs to conform to preconditions, which then allows us to focus uninterruptedly on reasoning and certify that the resulting procedure will terminate correctly, we should never forget why we actually design algorithms, and that is to solve real-world problems. Unfortunately, the desire to solve real-world problems is at timeless odds with this kind of abstraction, and let's study this example from the 1950s to see why. So the original interest in flow networks and flow algorithms started around the 1950s in the context of the Cold War. Uh, this uh, US military paper from Harris and Ross was studying uh, ways to estimate railway network capacities. Uh, in particular, they were interested in estimating the bottleneck properties of the Warsaw Pact railway network. And particularly, they were looking for the bottleneck of the railway network, so the maximally uh, stretched edges of the network. And uh, as we just discussed previously, these bottleneck edges can be related to the minimum cut problem. And intuitively, Harris and Ross had already assumed that you can relate the minimum cut to the maximum flow. So there is uh, uh, an obvious gain to running a flow algorithm over a flow network like this because it can help you analyze the properties of the uh, of the underlying uh, railway system. However, already in 1955, the authors of this uh, paper have seen one very critical problem to actually deploying an algorithm like this on the real world network. And that is that uh, the evaluation of what are the individual capacities and the whole railway system is to, to a considerable extent an art, how the authors say. The authors know of no tested mathematical model or formula that includes all the variations and imponderables. And even when someone has been intimately associated with the territory, the final answer on the capacities of the network, however accurate, is one of judgment and experience. Right? And this problem, overlooked by theoretical computer scientists because it doesn't really concern the core, uh, the core problem abstractly, uh, has been an important issue for the combinatorial optimization community for a very long time. Specifically, uh, in order to satisfy the preconditions of algorithms, you need to convert their inputs to this abstractified form. And if you do this manually, it might imply that you've baked in so much assumptions that you've lost a lot of information. And therefore, your combinatorial problem will no longer accurately portray the dynamics of the real world. So even if your algorithm can be proven to terminate with the perfect solution, it might do so in a totally useless environment. And actually, there's an even more fundamental limitation in that the data you need to apply the algorithm may be only partially observable, and this can even render the algorithm completely inapplicable. So this addressing this kind of issue, bridging the gap between real-world uh, noisy, high-dimensional, rich data and the low dimensional abstractified data that the algorithms are expecting is something that's an issue of high interest for both combinatorial optimization and operation research communities.
And as I promised to you at the very beginning of this talk, we'll be looking at uh, neurally spiced solutions for dealing with this problem. And specifically, let's try to abstractify the core problem. So let's assume we have some high dimensional noisy real world inputs, uh, but our algorithm only admits abstract inputs. So imagine you want to compute shortest paths between different points uh, uh, on, a, on a road network, but the road network is super complex. The traffic flow can dynamically change. There's traffic lights, changing weather conditions, roadblocks, and so on. And you have to take all of this complexity of the real world and you want to apply a pathfinding algorithm such as Dijkstra. Well, you cannot apply Dijkstra until you provide it an abstractified graph with given uh, edge weights uh, in every single edge between these abstract nodes, such as the one in the middle. And then you can apply the extras algorithm to get the shortest path tree, which is highlighted in red. So in the process of making Dijkstra applicable, uh, we have either manually or through some hand engineered heuristics transformed this richness of real data into an abstractified form to which we could apply the algorithm. And as you can see, the core issue, which might leave us vulnerable to inaccuracies, is the fact that we have manual feature engineering of this raw data. And if history is to teach us anything, whenever there's manual feature engineering of raw data, neural networks can become super attractive. And let's try to do exactly that. So first point of attack, good old fashioned deep learning, just replace the human feature extractor with a neural network that takes natural inputs to the inputs of the algorithm and then apply the algorithm. Now there's two issues with this, even though it's a potentially promising idea. Algorithms typically perform discrete optimization, which means that they don't play super nicely with gradient based optimization and neural nets thrive when they have gradients. However, there has been a really impressive line of work from, especially from Marin Vlastelica, uh, uh, where they've shown that there's a really great approach with which you can get gradients through any kind of black box combinatorial solver. So in a way, this is not really a huge issue and they have been able to effectively apply their methods to do pathfinding in diverse rich inputs such as these uh, two dimensional image maps of, uh, of Warcraft game. Uh, however, there is a second more fundamental issue, which is data efficiency. And uh, the real world data, as we discussed before, is often incredibly rich. And to apply the algorithm, you still have to compress it down to super small or even scalar dimensional values. And the algorithmic solver then commits to using those scalars and assumes that they're perfect. So if you don't have enough training data to properly estimate these scalars, you're gonna hit the same issues as before. Like even if your algorithm gives perfect solutions and you can push gradients through them, it might still do so only in a super suboptimal environment. So to break this algorithmic bottleneck, let's think back to how neural networks actually tackle such issues in a robust way. And especially neural networks derive a lot of flexibility from having these latent representations that are inherently high dimensional, which means that even if I mess up predicting a few components of my high dimensional latent, other parts of it can still step in and compensate. Not all is lost. And to effectively break this bottleneck, therefore, what we do is we'll replace the algorithm with a neural network. Note that this means that now our encoder network predicts high dimensional latents rather than algorithmic outputs. And then a processor network P is spun for a certain number of iterations, which transforms latent state to latent state in a way that hopefully mirrors the computations of the algorithm. And now, of course, Assuming that this processor network P aligns really well with the algorithmic steps, what this gives us is a very elegant end-to-end -end pipeline, which we can fully differentiate through as it's completely neural network layers. And there's no scalar-based bottlenecks in the middle, so you'll have higher data efficiency. Now, the big question is, how do we actually get these latent state neural networks that will align with algorithms? And this brings us to algorithmic reasoning which is an emerging area. And the reason why it's a separate area in itself is because what we want out of this processor network P is a bit different from what we want in typical deep learning applications. Specifically, processor networks are required to imitate the algorithm faithfully, which means they actually must extrapolate. So even if I give you an input that's much bigger than the one you've seen at training time, the extrapolation should be reasonable leveled, whereas most neural networks are only expected to generalize in distribution. And neural networks, as you know, typically really struggle in this regime. And this motivated the introduction of a completely new area, algorithmic reasoning, that seeks to ameliorate this issue, primarily through giving some theoretical, empirical, architectural prescriptions uh, that guide the neural networks or their featureizations that are useful to extrapolate combinatorially. 
I should note it's a super active research area with many key papers published only last year. So rather than trying to uh, go through all the foundational achievements one at a time, I've just prepared one slide with a TLDR of what are some of the things that we're already able to do quite well. Uh, the entire field, in my opinion, rests on this very important observation that graph neural networks as an architecture class align really well with dynamic programming. And uh, most polynomial time algorithmic computations can be expressed through the lens of dynamic programming. So this is a very good reason for why we might want to use graph neural networks to uh, model individual steps. And here I've illustrated in this picture, in the case of Bellman Ford, different components of a graph neural network can align well with different components of the DP algorithm. And guided by this, uh, in our paper published at ICLER 2020 on neural execution of graph algorithms, we explored a lot of interesting inductive biases and we discovered some architectural prescriptions and uh, training uh, regime prescriptions that are really important if we want uh, graph neural networks that extrapolate in this regime. Uh, following on from there, several very interesting works that study the application of algorithmic computation in various contexts, iter GNNs that study iterative computation, shuffle exchange nets that study linear rhythmic sequence processing, uh, pointer graph nets that study data structures, and persistent message passing that studies um, persistent data structures. And some of the latest insights show that uh, if you not only have alignment from an algorithmic perspective, but also in a way that all the different components such as message functions of the GNN have to learn functions that are close to linear, this is highly beneficial theoretically for ensuring a good level of extrapolation. And combined all of these ideas together, we get the blueprint of algorithmic reasoning. So we first learn such a processor network P as a part of a big data set of uh, artificial data for the algorithm that we can pre-generate. So this FPG pipeline in the, in the top learns to execute the algorithm and therefore capture its essence inside the processor network P, which operates on the latent state. Once we have a processor GNN that operates on the latent state, we can just plug it as a differentiable component inside any architecture that takes any kind of natural inputs to corresponding outputs. And this is where the true power of such models could uh, arise. What this means in practice is, uh, you know, you can imagine all these individual components as different graph structured inputs with their own encoder decoder functions to go from to and from the latent space of the processor. And inside the latent space, the processor actually performs GNN steps over the individual nodes and edges. Okay, so hopefully this presents to you how the blueprint looks like uh, in principle. I'd like to take the last few minutes to show you how the blueprint actually runs in practice. And to do this, we will study a very important and challenging problem of reinforcement learning, which I'm sure a lot of you have already seen before. It concerns act agents that act in an environment and the environment responds with certain observations. Uh, the agent may not just blindly react to what the environment says, it might also incorporate some kind of planning process, so some internal amount of thinking time which lets it carefully choose what's the action it's going to do to uh, uh, maximize certain kinds of returns. And uh, as you might know, the setting in reinforcement learning comes with various uh, different components and uh, variables. So the agent is in a particular state, uh, the planning uh, module computes a policy function for the agent to use that uh, predicts actions to take based on the current state. Then those actions are sent to the environment and the environment responds to the agent with some reward and the next state it should assume. And the way in which environment derives this is through its internal transition model and reward model, P and R. And uh, typically it's assumed that these uh, transition and reward models are not visible to us. So what the agent has to do is to derive a policy that will optimize the so-called discounted cumulative reward. So the cumulative rewards it observes over time with a slight preference for uh, immediate rewards. Okay, so uh, in this setting, actually, it turns out that there's an algorithm that will solve the RL problem perfectly, and that algorithm is value iteration. If we can start with some initial estimates of the value of each state, we can uh, run the so-called Bellman equation that's listed here to update the values of each state one uh, time step at a time based on the values of neighboring states and the immediate rewards and transition models. And this uh, iteration is actually guaranteed to converge to the optimal solution, the optimal value V star. Uh, 
And once you have V star, which is the optimal value of every state, well, then you just need to take whatever action will take you to uh, a neighboring state with a maximal value. So you can easily get an optimal policy once you have these v, uh, v stars computed. The big catch here is that to be able to run value iteration, you need to have full knowledge of the underlying uh, Markov decision process that governs the RL setting. Uh, therefore, in most cases, we know we don't have access to these guys. So uh, value iteration as the algorithm could be a prime target for our previously studied blueprint because it might allow us to apply value iteration even if we don't have access to all the parameters. And uh, how would a human feature engineer make value iteration applicable? Well, if you look back to a blueprint example, you could imagine a manual feature extractor that looks at uh, a really rich uh, Atari environment, for example, and figures out that underneath it's really just the grid world of a certain kind, and then it builds a grid world, and then you can run the raw value iteration algorithm in this tabular setting. As before, we want to automate away what this uh, human uh, engineer is doing and go from natural inputs straight to some kind of inputs to an algorithm. And uh, one way in which we can do that is through the idea of model-based planning. So if we have some kind of encoder that gives us embeddings for individual states, then uh, we can expand a local Markov decision process around it through a transition model T. Uh, the transition model takes embeddings of a state and uh, some representations of actions and predicts what's gonna be the embedding of the next state. There are many super popular methods for training such a Model T, usually in the context of self-supervised contrastive learning. In a nutshell, you have to find a way to discriminate the triplets of state action next state from any negative triplets state action randomly sampled state. And with this kind of training, you can actually build decent transition models in the latent space. Once you have a transition model like this, which taking an embedding and an action will give you the embedding of a neighboring state, you can use it to uh, expand the local MDP around the particular state. So you have your uh, raw frames from the Atari game once again. You run the encoder function Z to get your uh, embedding vector. And then once you have a transition model, you can just run it uh, maybe even in a breadth first fashion or with a more smarter expansion policy to derive some local latent graph around your uh, initial state just by building the embeddings of neighboring states. And assuming that you have uh, some other reward or value model from these embeddings, this would give us scalar values in every node we expand. And now we can directly apply a value iteration style rule, uh, like just directly apply the Bellman equation on these predicted reward models. And once you have these computed values, you can directly decide the policy from there. This kind of thinking gives rise to a huge family of models uh, that include TreeQN, A3C, value prediction networks, and so on. And this is a simple visualization of what these kinds of models do. They use this pre-trained transition model to expand uh, around the encoding of a particular state. And then they use their value and reward models to actually compute values in the leaf nodes. And then those are propagated upwards towards the node we started from. And then those values are used to estimate the actual policy. Okay. So it's good to take a step back and just realize everything we've done so far. We went from these natural inputs and uh, we mapped them using the encoder and transition model to this tree of states. And then we were able to run value iteration over that particular tree to estimate values. And we have exactly the same problem as before, even though this thing is end-to-end -end differentiable because value iteration itself is a differentiable function. Uh, we hit the bottleneck based issue once again. If we don't have enough training data to properly estimate these scalars, our algorithm will give a perfect solution, but once again, suboptimal environment. And just like we discussed before, to break the bottleneck, we will replace the value iteration update with a neural network. As before, we can use graph neural networks to perform these kinds of computations. And in fact, uh, graph neural networks and their uh, update rules that are given below align really, really well with uh, the uh, computations of value iteration. Like you can see, I've highlighted here how different parts of value iteration align really well with, uh, with neural network, uh, graph neural network computations. So we can use a graph neural network to just learn in a step-by-step -step manner how to execute value iteration and then plug it into the embeddings that were computed previously using the transition model. And putting it all together, this gives us the Xelvin architecture that we have published at uh, NeurIPS workshop last year. And uh, its components, encoder, transition, GNN executor, and policy heads together give you an end-to-end -end differentiable agent 
that performance value iteration in general uh, spaces while not having any bottleneck defects. And as a result, we're able to perform really well on low data environments, especially compared to the H3C family of models, which as I discussed is exactly the same as ours. However, they uh, compress data down to scalar representations and they directly apply the algorithm, whereas we apply the algorithm in a high dimensional space and therefore are uh, more easily dealing with bottleneck effects. And the trends are quite obvious in most of the environments we ran this in. Initially, this H3C model takes a long time to pick up uh, until you see enough data to estimate those scalars well. But uh, in that low data regime, it really seems to struggle to figure out what the correct scalars are. And it doesn't have any other dimensions of data to, to, uh, to use as backup, which our model does. So hopefully this convinces you that uh, doing the algorithmic reasoning blueprint and uh, pre-training algorithmic reasoners in this way is something that can be very beneficial for expanding the space of algorithmic applications. And I'd just like to do a few concluding remarks. So as I mentioned, our aim was to address three key questions. Why should we study algorithms as deep learning practitioners? How to actually build neural networks that incorporate ideas from algorithms? And finally, do these models actually work when they're deployed? Hopefully I've given enough uh, context for you to uh, trust me on these three points and also might have given you some ideas on where to apply these models. If you'd like to know more details about algorithmic reasoning and constructing good processors, uh, I've given several talks, including at last year's DLG workshop that are concerned specifically with that domain. So both of those talks are publicly available, so I would recommend checking them out. And furthermore, if you want to know a bit more about our implicit planning agent, I've given a talk just dedicated to that. And if you'd like to know a bit more about graph representation learning, uh, I've recently given a talk on theoretical GNN foundations, which could be useful. Uh, if you want to know more about algorithmic reasoning and our general context in which you can put GNNs uh, within the space of combinatorial optimization, we've recently released a 43-page survey on the topic, which is available on the archive. And uh, I would like to thank you all so much for listening and uh, to the organizers once again for inviting me and to all of my collaborators that have uh, worked with me on these topics and related ones. Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.